when you're working with diverse groups like ours, it is extremely different. Even though we're all on the same side of this issue, we all have uh, different organizations we're working with, with different, our values aren't identical. Some of, the, some of the most important ones are, so we're able to work together. But we always hear the message is everything. But the thing I wanted to kind of talk to you about today, and it really goes with what Bill was saying earlier, is that you can't really have a conversation until you have a com common language. And we're separated by having a common language. When I talk to the commercial breeders, and I use the word hobby breeder, it seem, means something altogether different than when I'm talking to my community. When we talk about rescue, are we talking about the kind of rescue that parent clubs have had since the, gosh, the middle of the 80s? Or are we talking about retail rescue? So my little part of this exercise, because my main talk today is done, is just to get you folks to think about what your, what words can you think of that we all ought to be trying to get on the same page with. I want to create a vocabulary so that we can have the kinds of discussions we need to have. Because right now, and I think Mark alluded to this in his talk too, there's so many nuances. I mean, everything that we do is about our heart. Everything is about our values. And so there's nuances. When, when, when we say a particular word, it doesn't resonate exactly the same with another, another one of the organizations. So for the whiteboard, I guess, one of the things I would like to do is just maybe start getting some of those words up that have different meanings in our communities. And we don't have to get 100 words today. Maybe we get 5, 10, whatever. But I would really invite you, uh, my email is at the bottom there, I would really invite you later to be thinking about these on your plane ride home or, or just, you know, uh, next week when you have nothing to do, be thinking about some of the words that we ought to be incorporating into a common vocabulary so that we can have the kinds of conversations we need. And that's really all that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I think that we all understand that we're not going to win by be, being continuously reactive, by just going down to the Capitol and fighting legislation, that we have to, um, to go on the offense. But to do that, there's just some strategic things that we need to do first. And one of those is this very simple thing about language. And with that, um, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna do a show and tell here. I want you to know that um, NAIA, we have, a, we have another website called Discover Animals. And it's showing on my screen, but not yours. Why is that? What's that? Yeah. What? Oh, I have PowerPoint still open someplace else. Should have Cindy up here full time. <laughs> okay, can you, did you get it? It's at the end of that part. Okay. Now, what do I do? It's on a PowerPoint. Oh, it's, it's in a PowerPoint, yeah. at the bottom of that one. There we go. I'm gonna just get on with it. This is there you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> So we have another, we have three websites, actually. We have NAIA Trust, which is the legislative website. We have NAIA, and they deal a lot with issues. Then we also have Discover Animals, and it's been going through a facelift that's been going on for almost a year. It should be up and programmed within another month or so. But it's got, um, it's really a very uh, general website for the public, anybody who likes animals. They're all there. It's got literally thousands of pages and they're beautiful. And I put that in there for Phil 
Phil, I want you to know that <laughs> that's going to be in our, anyway, and I, I won't go on about this, but uh, be prepared in a couple months to hear from us when it comes back up. And there will be pages for everybody to, um, to send us material that they'd like to see published, whether it's something from your parent club or you want to do an ad about something, whatever. It's going to be an interesting website. Um, and then our friend Tom here, I've worked with Tom, uh, he works on legislation in New Jersey. There happens to be a lot of legislation in New Jersey, both for you know the pet industry and also for biomedical research. And uh, he's put together, we have some ideas about going on the offense that have to do with initiating our own legislation instead of constantly having to just go down to the Capitol and fight the stuff the other folks bring up. And uh, Tom can also, there's only a few bills that we're going to talk about, right, Tom? Um, but we can also develop other bills for you, amendments for you if you want to. But the goal is to get into the Capitol and develop our own narratives. Because, you know, it's just like when I mentioned earlier, working on the high, um, Healthy Dog Importation Act, going to Congress after writing tons of articles and even being on television, nobody knew what the heck we were talking about. They didn't know the subject. So um, part of part of getting this, the word out is to go down there, have our own narratives and our own legislation that we want to introduce. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. So that we'll figure it out. Sure. All right. Well, um, I know we're a li little bit behind, so I will try to um, change up some. I think we we're looking for more, a lot of discussion, but uh, I'll try to be quick. I also realize I'm the last uh, thing before your plane ride home or a car ride, or for some of you, the bar. I'm looking at you, Cindy. Um, as Patty mentioned, I've been working in government affairs for a long time. Uh, I also serve on the Animal Law Committee of the Bar Association in New Jersey, but that's dominated by animal rights activists. I think this is the first time we share this outside of uh, or with a large group. My friend Nancy Halpern and I, many of you know her, we were able to get a new committee started called the uh, Animal Health, Welfare, Agriculture, and Veterinary Practice Law Committee. It's a mouthful, but it's, uh, to my knowledge, the first committee of its kind in a bar association that's uh, dedicated to exploring issues of the law um, that are related to industries that rely on the humane use of animals, like all the industries here. So we're really excited about that. It gives us an opportunity to go into some issues that uh, we'd otherwise not be allowed to because of our opponents who serve on that committee with us. So I think uh, anybody who was at last year's conference may remember uh, my kids are big into soccer, right? That was a theme of, of my presentation last year. Their favorite soccer team is the, the Philadelphia Union. They won last night three to one. Um, their um, saying, slogan, is that Latin phrase that, that's listed there at the bottom of that crest. I tried to pronounce it last year. I'm not going to try this year. Um, if anybody knows Latin and wants to pronounce it, go ahead and throw it out there, but I'm not. It's essentially join or die, right? And I offered a you know, presentation last year that was uh, trying to show some examples of, of how the animal activist community is trying to uh, overtake us, right? And, and how NAIA is the coalition we need uh, to, to overcome that, right? There's dog breeders here. There, there's reptile folks phil you got to, phil gets a shout out i think in every presentation it's great right lab animal research uh the the ag community NAI, nai is the organization that brings us all together right so that we can focus on the attacks from hsus PETA, white coat waste and uh countless more so i'm not going to spend any time outlining why nai is that organization uh, no, it, it, for a good reason. We all realize it is, right? I, I don't need to go into that and try to convince anybody 
uh, to, to join the coalition. You're, you're all here. Uh, you know, it's, it's the only organization that, that's trying to bring all these groups together to preserve the human animal bond. Instead, I'm going to try to show you uh, some examples of some legislation that's bad, show you some examples of some legislation that's good, as Patty, as Patty mentioned, and uh, try to go on the offensive. And since we've been on defense for so long, so going with my theme of soccer, that's called the counterattack. So th that's what we're going to do here a little bit and, and try to give you some tools to do that. Um, so let's look at some of these. All these bills I'm mentioning for the most part are New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey is a kind of a microcosm of uh, what we're dealing with across the country. So um, I'll, I'll tie it together at the end, but I think it'll make sense why they're all in New Jersey. This bill establishes a criminal offense dealing with the inhumane confinement of breeding pigs and calves. So this bill just passed uh, the state assembly on Thursday. It's already been amended in the Senate and it's geared up for a vote in the full Senate any day now. What's crazy? Even the New Jersey Farm Bureau can't find a, a pig breeder in the state that's using gestational stalls. Doesn't matter. It's a messaging issue. It's not gonna change anybody's practices in the state, but they're gonna pursue it. Hmm? Oh. Prohibits cropping or altering of tails or ears of a dog. Anybody have a breed of, yeah, there you go. Couldn't do that in New Jersey if this passed. Uh, prohibits the sale of dogs or cats, rabbits, and pet shops. And repeals what I think is uh, our state's Pet Purchase Protection Act, which is the strongest uh, consumer protection and animal welfare bill of its kind in the country. That gets thrown out the window. Uh, you know, I think there's now close to 400 local bans, local or state bans, right? We talked about that earlier. There's a couple of states that ban the sale of dogs, cats, and pet stores. Of those about 400, 150 of them or so are in New Jersey. So it, we're, we're the home to that movement. Since we got involved, we've actually fought them. We take on the activists. We win some, we lose some, um, but it's fun. We, we get to uh, share our views and they get angry, um, storm out call people communists and, and run out of the, out of the uh, hearing room. It's crazy. <laughs> um, this is another bad one. And uh, if it doesn't speak to who has influence over the legislative decisions, I don't know what does. Um, not here, I'm not taking a position on declawing cats, right? But what concerns me is the legislature's getting involved. They're, they're using their judgment over that of a veterinarian. They are uh, defining the scope of veterinary medical practice, not the AVMA, and they're uh, casting aside VCPR. Did I get that right, Marty? VCPR, right? So th that's what the legislature's doing in New Jersey, deciding what medical pr procedures you can do with your animals. This is a new one. Um, Cindy and I have talked about this. Cindy has told, told you how much the research community cares about their animals, not just dogs and cats, right? The lengths they go to rehome these animals. Cindy, how long did you hold on to sheep trying to rehome them? Right? This isn't something that's needed. What this would do though is create a treasure trove of data that needs to be reported to the state that the animal rights groups could submit open public records requests to get. And then they're going to use that to target our folks, to target the research community. What's interesting too, it allows the um, animal rights groups to, you know, to allege all these violations. So now if a research institution is found to violate this law for rehoming an animal or not rehoming an animal when they go to great lengths to do it. It's a $10,000 fine for a first offense, a $50,000 fine for a second offense, and any third or subsequent offenses, they, they, the state can seek an injunction to uh, prohibit that institution from working with animals. So, you know, Bristol-Myers Squibb is a huge pharmaceutical company. They're based in New Jersey. 
the state can seek an injunction to prevent that them from using animals to develop all that life-saving research or those life-saving uh, therapies and, and things like that, that we all rely on. Very bad and misguided bill. And I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, you're okay, you're dog breeders and good ones. It's not gonna come and affect me. How about this one? Directs DOH to adopt dog breeding standards, prohibits dog breeding without a USD license and compliance with DOH standards. So here's what this bill would do. You need to have a USDA license in order to breed your animal. And you have to do it based on guidelines that the Department of Health would create. How many of you, do you know what you need to get a USDA license for a dog breeder? How many breeding females do you need? Four, over four. Does anybody, I mean, some of you I assume have more than four, correct? But many of you don't. Yeah. If you read uh, number one there, uh, for a violation, you, you know, you breed your dog, look what that violation is. You forfeit your dog and its offspring. So, I mean, that's a bad bill, don't get me wrong. We beat that one. I haven't seen it reintroduced in, in the current session, but it's just an example. The animal rights groups, they're coming after everybody. Last year, um, when I gave a similar presentation, I was tracking 147 bills in the New Jersey legislature dealing with animals. Uh, last week, or, or earlier this week when, when I put it together, I was up to 202, all right? So just, just look at all these right here. The, the ag community, dog breeders, long-standing animal husbandry practices, lab animal research, we're all under attack. Even more concerning, um, this is so bipartisan now. All right? it, it's not just uh, a, a typical you know, liberal effort on the animal rights community. For those of you here last year, do you remember Dr. Peterson's presentation about uh, was it sand fleas and leishmaniasis? Lice, Did I get that right? All right, that, that's a hard one. So you can, you can thank White Coat Waste for putting this all together during COVID, right? There was a, the attacks on Dr. Fauci. Um, there was an article really misrepresenting some of that like leishmaniasis uh, research that was taking place. And they did that from a fiscal perspective, that it was wasteful, that the research wasn't doing anything, that these animals were suffering. It's working, right? I now see bills in state legislatures all the time with Republican co-sponsors, Democratic co-sponsors, even, you know, just Republicans on these animal rights bills, not just the lab animal bills where a lot of this got started. So it's branching out. They're coming for you. So if you think you're in a state that uh, traditionally didn't have any of these issues because it, it, it's uh, you know a Republican state, a red state, you're in for a surprise. They're coming. The animal rights groups are everywhere. So just this morning, right? I was getting ready. You know those cute little bars of Dove soap that are in there. Look what I saw. It's approved by PETA. So. Uh, there's something poetic, um, you know, scrubbing your butt with pita soap. And, and I, I'm sure there's a joke there somewhere. Um, I, I didn't have enough time to figure that out yet, but they are everywhere. Right. This is from the Animal Ag Alliance. Right. Th this shows how interconnected all these animal rights groups are. Right, they're all working with each other. It's hard to read, but there, there's different the color coding and who's working with whom, who's giving money to whom, but they're all interconnected and they're trying to prevent you to do what you do with the animals that you love. This is just a, another example, right? They're all coming back to HSUS in the center there. This shows how much money they have. This was put together by the National Association for Biomedical Research for another presentation I was involved with a couple months ago. So there, there's a lot of groups that are dedicated to, uh, you know, lab animal research and targeting them. But just look, ASPCA, Humane Society, PETA, just those top three, that's $650 million they're sitting on to come after all of you. That's a lot of money. Do you have that much, Patty? No. 
we're close. They are willing to spend lots of money to target all of us. But Patty and NAI and all of you here, right? They're there to protect your rights. This is from Patty's website. Excuse me. I, I can't help but call NAI Patty's. I, I, so I apologize to everybody. I, it's just a habit. Um, these are some of the big things that this organization does. But what I want to do is focus on this first one. Helping animal, control, helping animal control and oversight agencies write reasonable laws that target irresponsible and humane owners while safeguarding responsible animal ownership and use and appropriate animal husbandry practices. So what I want to do is look at some of the ways that we can do that. And I, you know, I, I had anticipated this being a uh, kind of exchange. We generate a lot of ideas. I don't know if we have time for that. We can talk about it at the end, but uh, I'm also always available via email or phone call. We'll help put together some legislation that you can bring to your states. Um, just first, you know, we talked about this earlier. This organization has helped lead the charge in Congress to promote the Healthy Dog Importation Act. Uh, they were even involved, right, in making sure the CDC stopped all those animal imports from the countries with high incidence rates of rabies. Um, that, that's still ongoing. But we can do that at the state level. We can stop all the animal importations from the states that have disease that threaten your animals. Uh, stop the retail rescue operations who are seeking the profit under the guise of you know saving animals and doing good. And we can do it by protecting you know the breed specific rescues that Patty mentioned. And I think what was the new term? Responsible rescue that we're going with. So we can protect all those. We can even do it. How about we include some language in there to make sure that we're not bringing any uh, brucellosis animals or maybe heartworm positive animals or uh, canine distemper, right? Let's get some testing in before these animals are, are brought in. Let's make sure there's CVIs that are associated with them and, and medical records that come in. Yeah. There you go. We can do all that. Right, there's a whole list of things we can add to this. This is just, right, just a start. How about we continue to honor NAIA and Cindy and the Homes for Animal Heroes program? We've got a bill in New Jersey. It, it's not the model bill, but it's close. We were dealing with a, a bill that we really didn't want to uh, work with. And we had a sponsor who was not all that favorable but we got a lot of what we wanted in this bill. And the simple fact that we call it the Homes for Animal Heroes program takes the power back from the animal rights groups. You know, they're trying to force all of these rehoming bills on us. We talked one just a few minutes ago. They're all over. I think there's 15 states that have this in, in law now. It was introduced in almost 30 by this point. Let's take control back. You know, let's uh, make sure that we're doing what we can to honor those heroes that make the research possible. So Washington and New Jersey have Homes for Animal Heroes Retirement Acts. We can do that in all these other states too and not use those acts to punish the research community. How about the Healthy Pet Purchase Protection Act? I mentioned right our, what I think is one of the best consumer and animal welfare laws for pet sales from stores in the country in New Jersey. We can take some of that and make sure that um, the animal rescue organizations, those retail rescue groups, that they're subject to the same laws and regulations and restrictions that our pet shops are. So uh, Pat, I think you said it earlier, right? Whether you know, you're getting your dog at, at a shelter or rescue, you're exchanging money, you're buying a dog. So let's be honest with that. And let's try to make sure that we're doing what we can so that it's a level playing field but more importantly, that the animals are healthy. For all the pet shops out there, how about we stop some of the uh, local towns and cities from passing the, that HSUS model ordinance and uh, have a comprehensive policy at the state level so that we don't have to go town to town fighting bans. And I recognize that this idea isn't gonna work in all states, 
but in some states it will. And we'll, we'll provide the tools for you guys to do that and, and bring those uh, to your states. In states where it's not, the Model Pet Purchase Protection Act or the Healthy Pet Purchase Protection Act can help. You know, as a quick aside, I was with a bunch of animal rights activists and they were complaining, how is a, a rescue organization supposed to make sure that their animals are seen by a veterinarian every 14 days? It, it, it's too costly. It can't be done. They didn't realize pet shops in New Jersey already need to do that. It can be done. Anybody know what these cost of care bills are? Are you familiar with those? Or, or you know, some, some states call it bonds. This, um, I'll try to be brief with this. Essentially, you're, you're accused of animal cruelty or, or there's a complaint filed or, or a humane law enforcement officer thinks that you, there's animals at risk on your property. They can go in, seize your animals. And then you don't get them back, but they're being held in a shelter. Maybe they go to a foster agency, a foster home, but you're on the hook for the cost of the care. It can far exceed what it costs to maintain that animal in your home. And if you don't pay, you could, your animal can be forfeited simply because you can't afford the cost of care. You've, done, you've been, not been found guilty of any crime. Your animals could be healthy. You don't get them back. You have to pay for them. And then when you don't, they're no longer yours. Worse yet, they can be euthanized. Um, they can be altered. You know, I, I think that's important for, for many of you out there. These bills also promote the private interests of, of third party organizations. The big animal rescue organizations are the one promoting these bills, right? They often have contracts with local agencies to um, you know, be the animal control. There's not a lot of animals. So some, they, some years they make money, but you know, when, they, when there are the, these large rescue situations, they then, you know, they're seeking to get more money, but then you, you see all the GoFundMe campaigns and, and those uh, efforts to bring in even more money. So they're, they're, I said double dipping, but I, I think they're actually triple dipping on, on some of these things. The worst part is these have a disproportionate impact on people from lower, economic status, right? If you can't afford it, your animal is going to be lost. It could be forfeited. So I was trying to look for something that um, kind of spoke to what we needed. And, and I came across um, the AKC's comment on this. They've been active in this bill in New Jersey. Barb Reichman and I have talked about this. We've advocated uh, against these bills in New Jersey. But AKC's statement, which I, I put right here on the screen, I think it is really in a nutshell what we're looking for. Anyone convicted of animal cruelty should be held accountable, including paying for the cost of caring for animals they mistreat. While those found not guilty or whom charges are against are dropped must be made whole through a return of the seized animals and a refund of all assessed costs. That, that's fair. Right? None of us want to stand for anybody who, who's being cruel to an animal. But when you're not being cruel, you shouldn't have to risk losing your animal. So we have a model cost of care bill. You know, how about first we ensure that if there's a co-owner, any of you co-own your dogs with anybody? You know, maybe you're out of state, you don't know what's happening. Rather than that animal being seized and going to, to a shelter, how about you get the right to have it back? Instead of requiring anybody not yet found guilty to pay for the cost of care, how about letting a judge decide the entire circumstances and use his or her judgment and the uh, fiscal uh, status of the accused? So instead of, you know, many of these laws are set up to, by operation of law, you're on the hook for it. How about the judge can decide if you should pay for it or, or if you should get your animals back right away? Instead of it automatically, your ownership of the animal being automatically forfeited in the shelter or rescue organization, getting control of your animals. Again, letting the judge decide, having that may transfer ownership of the animal. Again, considering the uh, financial status of the animal's owner. And then this G down here, we can also make sure that the animal is not altered, adopted out, or euthanized. 
finally, if the accused is found not guilty, not only do they get their animal back, they get reimbursed for all the money that they paid. Those all sound reasonable, right? Not to the other side. So let me try to tie it all together. We've sat back and reacted to the endless onslaught from the animal rights community. I think Cindy inspired you. I know Patty has inspired you. Bill, I, I think inspired a lot of you. I, I feel like I'm the Debbie Downer here uh, talking about all the bad things that are happening, but you know, let's go on the offensive. Um, let's counter attack in our home states. Let's bring some of these bills and let's win. So for anyone who watches soccer, um, NAIA six, Animal Extremics Zero, that's a blowout, right? So I, that, that's the way I guess I'm tying it together from the beginning with soccer again. Um, so we got these bills, we can make changes, we can tower them to your states, right? Um, they reference, you know, insert animal cruelty statute reference here, things like that. Insert whatever state agency is involved. Reach out to me, reach out to Patty, reach out to anyone else who can help. We'll help draft the bill. And we will help, you know, provide the tools so that you can get them uh, enacted. So let, let's not react and try to, you know, defeat these bad bills. Let's go and, and let's get some good bills that protect your interests. More importantly, that protect your animals. So I'd love to see if there's any ideas, other things that you guys would like to consider, things we can work into some of these bills, entirely new bills. Any thoughts? But it's also, it'd be having a judge decide maybe better than you're automatically going to the shelter, at least have somebody who's able to exercise their judgment. Oh, so I, I misspoke a little bit then. If you're not guilty, you're getting, getting your animal back for sure. It's, it's this interim dependency of the, the action. You, you, maybe you shouldn't lose your animal. First of all, you should get it back if, if you didn't do anything and the judge can consider that. But if you're found not guilty, not only do you get your animal back, you get all the costs that you paid. Anything, any other ideas? Patty? What was the uh, New Jersey bill number that dealt with uh, banning of cropping and docking, please? Assembly Bill 3680. This is this is not one that's been defeated. I mean, it hasn't had a hearing, but it but it's still an active bill. What are the chances are of that going through? Uh, this session, I would say zero. But uh, we need to prepare for uh, future. Mm -hmm. When when will the uh, legislative body be back in session? They're in session right now. In, in New Jersey, we don't really ever stop. Oh, so the, the legislature is going to go until June 30th. And then they go, uh, it's an election year in New Jersey. So they'll be away until after the November elections, thankfully. Okay. And then they'll come back from November until the middle of January. Okay. So I think the session ends January 12th at midnight. The new session begins January 13th at 12 p.m. Okay. We don't ever stop. All right. And I can get the language from you? Sure. Okay. Thank you. You've had enough. I'm kidding. Go ahead. Anyway, uh, it has to do with arrest me. Hold on. Why? How would I need that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, it has to do with the rescues, like in Florida. Mm -hmm. We have the big dog ranch constantly. She wants to be the number one rescue in the United States. And there's a lot of money, a lot of politics behind that. My question is, we need to really come up with some kind of language. Maybe you can help me find um, a legislation or something in Florida that we can put regulations into the rescue groups. 
Right now, this woman just bought 189 dogs from um, an auction in the Midwest while rescues, because of the nonprofit organizations, they're not supposed to buy dogs. She's getting away with it. She's going to be, be investigated now because we're pushing. But we really, really need to start writing some kind of legislation that these rescues cannot be exempt anymore. I have pages and pages of rescues being charged for misuse of funds and for animal cruelty. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would like to see something that we can come up, you know, and present for regulating the rescues. I think, you know, that, that healthy dog importation act or, or the, you know, the pet, the healthy, the pet purchase act can address some of those. There's some, I couldn't obviously show the whole bill, but we have language in there that would, uh, prohibit rescues from buying dogs and, and trying to, you know, pass them off. Right. I, I think I think we have a lot there we can put together. Exactly. Um, I I just have been posting out on Facebook about the conference, and um, a friend of mine just sent me this, and it has to do in um, South Carolina, and it says. Um, did you know that if you live in or are driving through South Carolina with a dog that has been dyed, like pink on its tail, that sometimes you see an agility, your dog can be confiscated and you can be charged with animal cruelty and the dog will not be returned to you. The penalty is mandated by the law, so the judge cannot show leniency. It's South Carolina House Bill 3247. I'll take a look. I'm not familiar with it, but again, they're everywhere, right? I have a question about the declawing of the cats, because from a healthcare perspective, I look at patients if they have a blood factor uh, disease, and that would be injurious to them. Yeah, there are some provisions. Um, the If it's necessary for the animal, they would allow it. But if it's necessary for that animal to stay in a loving home because uh, somebody has a disease, it gets scratched, it, you know that that shouldn't be considered you also have to report anytime you do a, a declawing procedure to the state so they can monitor you under that bill thank you yeah so oh in, in thinking god yes in terms of preserving our breeds and taking care of our animals and also <clears throat> some of the considerations of requiring veterinary certificates and care i'd like to see us promote funding for uh, veterinary colleges, for reproductive specialists, for more money to produce quality veterinarians. There's definitely a shortage in the Northwest. Shortage and, everywhere. Uh, shortage everywhere. And I'd like to see us be at the forefront of advocating for uh, veterinary education, more vets, qualified vets. We, ha we have a bill in New Jersey. Well, we don't have a, a vet school in New Jersey. There's one coming, I think, in 2025. But there's actual uh, legislation that good legislation that's been put together to help fund, um, you know, more veterinarians. So I can take a look at that. And I think it could be adopted, adapted to uh, that situation. Uh, we are going to be, I guess, putting together the vocabulary list. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'd like to suggest a first word, and it's a very important word. I'm a breeder, and we had lunch today, and I didn't realize that, that people that are not actively involved with the show side of things don't understand at all what we do. It was just an amazing conversation. And they were amazing. They were like, Oh my, I had no idea. And these are well-educated people in their area. So being able to communicate is extremely important among us. Um, and the word that I'd like to do is preservation because we label ourselves as preservation breeders. And this is extremely important 
aspect of who we are and what we do. So um, that there's a vocabulary word. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so one of the issues I, I do see is um, I, I like the model language, although unfortunately, when when it comes to um, guilt, uh, a lot of times that's a question of how much justice can you afford? Um, and there's a lot of plea deals that are taken where someone will plead guilty whether or not they're culpable. Um, sure. So one of the, the things that I think, uh, and, and this goes uh, for, for all different species from dogs to snakes to, to fish, is, is I think a, a legal defense fund, uh, because we're letting a lot of test cases slide by um, that would that would work to our advantage in, in creating um, precedent. But unfortunately, a lot of these are individuals who can't afford that much justice. Uh, so I think that's something we should consider. And, and that's something that would from that would affect everyone from the biggest drug company to the, the little guy. Um, and I, th I think we're losing a lot by not paying attention to some of these smaller test cases. Yeah. It's a, a, like a, a, a good version of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. <laughs> That's a great idea. Bob. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I have a couple of things. Um, I agree with the lady over here that spoke about um, people don't know the show breeders. They do not know the commercial breeders either. I do understand that you are preserving the breeds, but that is exactly what the commercial breeders are doing also. Um, it may be different, but you're still, the ultimate goal is the preservation of the breeds. Um, the other thing is when you were showing um, the, uh, the dew claws or the cropping of the tails, mm -hmm. um, that is in every state in the nation. That's what HSUS does. You can look in any state and they will put that there, even if there's not an issue, they will do it anyway, because then it's on the books. Because we have this in the state of Missouri, they have done, tried it for numerous years, and luckily we've been able to fight them. But again, like he said, doesn't matter whether they're Democrat or Republican, used to, doesn't anymore. Yeah, I know AKC was involved um, with this, trying to get exemptions related to due clause. The, the legislature wouldn't budge. They thought it was going to create some loophole that could be exploited. A simple piece of legislation um, that could potentially be added to the uh, the Healthy Pet Act uh, in any of the states uh, is um, quarantine periods. It's it's one of those things. I, I've had this fight yeah. several years in a row in Massachusetts. Uh, the retail rescues are the ones that scream bloody murder about it because they liked it. one of their models there since the Northeast has to import so many dogs every year is they literally pull a semi truck into a parking lot and everybody comes to pick up their adoption. Uh, so establishing quarantine periods, while it is an inconvenience and an expense for a retail store, really helps to weed out some of the retail rescue that's going on. And it's Perfect. simple language. And particularly since COVID, it's a very easy pitch. Perfect. Is someone taking notes? Because I'm not right now. There's too many good ideas. You got it all? All right, perfect. Got to wait for the mic. Oh, Dallas, hang on. We got a, we got a cue going on here. So just a couple of things I want to share. Um, I think we really need to look at the PACFA model in Colorado because of the information that we're getting out. And they are regulating rescue and shelter. Of course, not to the degree that we want. Um, they just added to the pack the rule uh, disease control, and it really came because of the rescues and the shelters and the problem of the disease that's coming in through rescue and shelter. So uh, just a short story about this. You could, as a rescue, you can buy a package of puppies. It would maybe, or of dogs, it would consist of a, a pregnant mother and her four-week-old babies, a blind dog, a deaf dog, and maybe a three-legged dog. So of course the mother and the babies are easily adopted out and it doesn't matter if they have heartworm or anything that they have, right? They can cure these puppy or treat these puppies and this mother and then sell them. <clears throat> and then they're warehousing the deaf dog, the three-legged dog, and it's becoming a real problem. PACFA has their eyes on this and sees 
that the disease, so I sat on this disease control as, as a pet store and really had no place there considering all of the things that we're doing to prevent disease. But such a defense that came up, like, like I saw the, the thing that you said about vaccination or uh, the importation into states. And they're like, well, we can't control what other states do. Because that was the first thing I said is, well, let's require heartworm testing before they come in. Let's require vaccinations before they came in. And they said, there's no way we can do that. There's no way we could regulate what other states do. Um, Yeah, we got a lot of pushback, but I think it's a start. The disease control is a, is a start, you know, of, of a rule that they've that they've added. Um, but I think PACFA has really helped to protect us in in Colorado in in many many ways. And Patty is, you know, she was at the creator of of some of that. Um, so that's one thing I would talk about, you know, trying to push for for other states. Um, the other thing about seven or 10 years ago, they tried to do the uh, veterinarian where the dogs coming in to Colorado had to be inspected by a state, Colorado state vet. And as pet stores, we didn't even have to even present or talk or anything about it. The vets gave so much pushback. And I think now since COVID and the lack of, of veterinarians, um, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but I just don't, I don't know if anything like that would even be realistic because I think we would get the pushback from the vets that they can't just, they can't do that. So just a little thought on some of that. No, it, it, not everything, right? It's a model we can adapt. Not everything's going to work in, in every state, but let's just put some ideas out there. I, I agree. Hi, I'm from Florida and we do have this big dog ranch rescue and what we're finding in retail rescue uh, because of the CDC and the USDA um, prohibiting the importation of dogs with the African swine fever and then with the rabies, is they're holding them on the Canadian border now for six months and paying for board. Wow. And that's what we're experiencing with the delay in Florida. So I wanted to point out a problem, you know, AKC DNA program. Um, we've been seeing some legislation coming out that's requiring genetic testing of dogs. There was just a bill in Illinois um, that said that dogs had to be genetically tested in order to be bred. And it was very vague. And I just wanted to point out that um, AKC government relations, Sheila Goff and I, um, have been working on some of those um, getting resources available to help fight some of those bills. So if you see any of those bills come out, like I think there'll be more and more, um, you can always come to us for recommendations or we can even work with NAIA, but I think this is going to be an emerging problem. It's it's something we're seeing that's been going on. That's scary. Yeah, just on the vet issue, that's something I've kind of heard all over the West and you know all over the country now is just the lack of vet care. And this could be uh, a policy area we could really be uh, kind of solutions oriented and build a lot of credibility with lawmakers. Uh, you know, just in California, there's a numerous bills this year trying to expand access to to vet care, and it's only and I this it's gonna it's just gonna keep growing everywhere as everyone knows. It's just so hard to find a vet especially if you're rural or if you're in, you know, an urban environment where maybe it's a lower income, it's impossible to get vets in these places. So anything we could do to expand access in these areas, uh, number one is, you know, good for the welfare of animals, which is what we're actually ultimately about, but it also helps to build credibility with lawmakers too. So I highly, you know, suggest, you know, talking with your, your lawmakers at the state level, if you can, and, and, you know, let them know that this is an issue that they need to address. Perfect. Okay, I'm kind of confused because this is the first time I've really tried to wrap my head around this. And I know you guys probably do this every day, but I am having a hard time understanding what is cruelty. Because to me before cruelty was like that, that poor dog, that little white dog that was all starved and was thrown out on the side of the road. It wasn't dying a dog or taking dew claws off or all these other, what I would call, uh, but that's me and I'm old school, you know? So I just, 
cruelty is in the eye of the beholder, but what is cruelty? I mean, I don't get it after listening to all this. How do you fight cruelty when cruelty to somebody, because I'm on Facebook and all those people from England, it's illegal to do this and that and this and all these people from Europe. I don't want to live in those countries where everything's illegal. And who are the people abusing to the point, I mean, yes, some people fall on hard times and get poor and they can't vet their dogs. Some people get old and they can't physically go out there and feed their cows anymore and their horses. And you hear about animal hoarders. But I don't, you know, it's just a hard thing to wrap your head around when you come to this and you hear all this. Where do you start? And I know I'm not helping, but that's where my brain is right now after listening to this. So maybe it's where a lot of people well, I, will I be think, after listening to this. I think there needs to be a revision or a rewrite of many states animal cruelty statutes right? they got started in the 1800s 1850s whatever and, and they've just been added to year and, and there's just all these enumerated things that are animal cruelty but no clear definition you know in in new jersey leaving your husky outside for more than 30 minutes when it's under 32 degrees that's animal cruelty right it, we've got to we got to start forget what's there and actually develop a good model so we know what's cruel and, and it, it's not just X, Y, and Z. It, we can't, we can't define everything. So, yeah. Are you, are you, are you familiar with the difference between animal welfare and animal rights? Yeah, I think that that's, that's really interesting. I don't know. I mean, that was when you put the dog park all night and the new that's like neighborhood nuisance or something. No, a lot of the laws that we're getting now are not based on your traditional understanding of animal welfare and what's humane and what isn't. It comes from an ideology and the ideology that's espoused, the people who espouse it call it animal rights. And it's a belief that any use of animals, whatever, is, uh, is inhumane. And there's a spectrum. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you have, yeah. But they're actually it's human. Probably. Yeah, they're they're busy, and a lot of times. One thing I wanted to say that came up when we were answering other questions and stuff. A lot of the laws that the other side passes, they really use as marketing. They're not. They don't really care at the end of the day if that bill passes. They want to have an opportunity to have a conversation with lawmakers from their particular point of view and to sell that point of view and to give that information to them. And that's why we see that we very often will defeat a bill the first time, maybe even the second time. But by the time we get to the third time, these folks are completely saturated with this misinformation. So that, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why it's important for us to be presenting our own information, not so we can present misinformation, but so that we can develop these conversations and we can put our point of view and have a particular narrative around the kinds of things that we think are valuable. I think that's, you know, so we want to, you know, if we, if we, the laws that we're going to write are going to be valuable, real laws that can help, but there's a secondary value to them, which is getting in there and developing the relationship and narrative. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So I'm I'm sorry to change the subject just a little bit, but I wanted to um, speak to the veterinary issue and the more money for veterinarians, veterinarians and and veterinary students. Um, I'm with Mount Hood Doberman Pinscher Club, and the DPCA, which is the Doberman Pinscher Club of America, does have a program in place for grants for veterinary students who want to learn cropping and docking because we need vets who are able to do that well, not just do it, but do it well. So um, thank you. So to get back to the South Carolina bill, re-dying pets. So I just pulled up the South Carolina law and it's specific to chickens, ducklings, fowl, rabbits. And clearly that was designed for Easter when that used to happen. So we have to be accurate in how we discuss the laws as well. You know, it does, it, it does, it, no. It will. It's a criminal offense to die a chicken. 
I think they were thinking about the bill that would make it apply to. So I think she said there was a bill that would make that apply to dogs. That's what she said. And they grow fresh better get on. Where's Cindy? You got one? No. One of the things that when they pass something like that, say for the chickens or the rabbits or any animal, that is their in to go after the dogs. They will always do that. And you have to understand how HSUS works. Number one, they want to eliminate animal ownership, not just the breeders, they want to eliminate it. They believe that all animals on this planet are on the same level as a human being, period. So they should have the same rights as we do. And that is not the way it's supposed to be. We're to be caretakers and be humane in our animals, but that is not their ideology. And I just wanted to put that point out there. Yeah, they have a 40-year plan. that They're in it for the long haul and, and incremental change is, is what they seek. And before you know it, you're gonna wonder what happened to your animals. Is it my turn? Sure. <laughs> uh, I want to change this a little bit. This is my first time attending the conference, and I want to let you know I got away with so much information, and I really appreciate all the speakers. I want to, want to speak it from a positive point of view that I got so much information that I could assimilate to all my friends, all my colleagues, all my members, the club that I belong to. I belong to numerous clubs. So one of my colleagues is not feeling well, so I'm going to be leaving. So I really appreciate and thank you very much. And good luck to all of us in our pursuit of happiness. Thank you. I don't know if anybody can top that final comment. Might be might be a good place to end, but I'm I'm here to talk with anybody. I think it is probably time to bring this topic to an end. Many of us are going to stick around for a little while. You can just gossip if you like, but but I think maybe this show is coming to an end. Thank you. Thank you. Wrapping it up. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, please copy down. Um, my email is naia at naiaonline.org. And uh, please feel free to write us at any time and to, con and to continue with these ideas about words. It's more important than it looks like on the surface. It really is. So thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Um, thank you. I think we're done. <laughs> I think we're just like Before everybody leaves, as Bill said, we must all have a goal. Here's my goal for all of you. Now, I'm not sure exactly where we're going to be for next year's conference, but the goal is to bring somebody with you. Go back to your clubs, go back to your organizations, your friends, neighborhoods, wherever, and bring somebody, maybe two or three, bring them with you to the conference. So they too can come for the first time and see what a wonderful organization. You learn so much. And thank you all for coming. And we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.